Well, howdy, everyone. I'm David Glazer. I'm here with a, a, a boatload of colleagues. Andrew? Hello. Chelsea? Hi there. Pari? Hi. So we are going to do what I think is the hardest webinar of the year, the regulatory update. And it's hard for a few reasons. First, we actually have to learn a lot for this one because you're processing a boatload of rules in a short period of time. Second, it's hard because we don't always know what you guys care about. We have some idea. We do this stuff a lot. But, um, but you wonder, right? So please bear with us as we work our way through it. Uh, just a handful of announcements. First, a giant welcome back to Pari. She was not here for our Frequently Asked Questions webinar because she was in a trial on a, on a kind of a non-compete tortious or a breach of fiduciary duty trial um, with colleagues, Nicole Moan, uh, Bridget Penick and Kendra, or Penick, sorry, and, and Kendra uh, Simmons, and they won, which was cool. Um, in fact, if I were ever in a giant civil pickle, I would call Nicole and Pari in a heartbeat. Uh, but so that was neat. Welcome back. Uh, our next webinar on, we don't know the date yet. It'll probably, it might be the, the third Wednesday in January, but it is not fixed, is going to be on new business models. Uh, Ryan Johnson and Steve Beck are going to kind of talk about the various, you know, everything from sort of private equity to other kind of creative ideas. They've come up with some really neat ideas. So that will be January. February is going to be all about opioids. And if you would have questions or things you think we should cover in the opioid crisis, you could send them to me or to Katie Hilton. I think Kate, Katie is going to be running the point on that. That one will definitely not be the second Wednesday. It'll probably be the third Wednesday in February. All right. Only other announcement is or a couple of ones, procedural stuff. Remember, you can always watch these online afterwards on the YouTube page. You know, if you miss one and you ever want to watch it, you can watch it in your car. Um, you're not, well, that way you're driving, people. Good grief. You should see the looks I got for that one. Uh, but you can listen to it while you're driving in the car. You get the sound only. All right. Uh, enough of the procedural stuff. What are we going to talk about? So we're going to start off with the fee schedule. Chelsea is going to go for a minute, then Andrew um, and, and I, we're all going to talk about parts of the physician fee schedule. Uh, we'll talk about the proposed anti-kickback and stark regulations. That will be surprisingly quick. The outpatient prospective payment rule, the hospital price transparency rule, and then a cup of coffee on the 2020 IPPS from PARI. Um, first, just one, we got a couple of trivia questions, so here's one. So this is rewards people who listen to a lot of our webinars and pay attention to minutia. So we're going to have some discussion about supervision. And the current rules about supervision came out on a holiday. Um, I don't know if I should even mention the year. So, because if you, uh, so if you know when the current supervision rules and the kind of it was all about, or actually it was it was diagnostic testing and IDTFs when the IDTF rule came out on a holiday, first person to get the holiday right gets a prize. Chelsea, take it away. All right, so as David mentioned, uh, Andrew, David, and I are going to be talking about this year's physician fee schedule. And as we were digging into this, we identified a few fees. So we're going to be starting off by talking about the opioid epidemic, of course, which is on everyone's minds. Um, we also noticed some trends with reducing administrative burdens and modernizing scope of practice. And of course, there's a few things we couldn't fit into those buckets. So we'll cover a few miscellaneous FYIs. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Andrew Holm. I'm in uh, Fredericksons Healthcare and Mergers and Acquisitions Practice Group. I'm going to talk about, uh, we're going to dig into the fee schedule here. Um, we're not, like David said, we're not covering everything that's included in the fee schedule, but hopefully we will cover the topics that you as the audience find uh, interesting or useful. Uh, if there's any, if you have any questions about a topic we don't cover, feel free to reach out to us uh, directly. So the first topic I want to cover is up on the, uh, it's on the slide, there's a new Medicare Part D benefit. The new benefit added as a result of the Support Act and it covers opioid use disorder or OUD treatment services furnished by an opioid treatment program or OTP. So we foreshadowed uh, this, this new benefit in last year's webinar. The final rule was adopted with some minor tweaks um, so, as background, previously beneficiaries had to go out of pocket for OUD outpatient services. So, this, uh, this proposed rule covered services that uh, would include five things um, FDA approved opioid agonist and antagonist medications, 
uh, dispensing and administration of the medications, sub substance abuse. I'm going to just interrupt yeah. you and say one of the reasons this is hard is I hear opioid antagonist thing and go, what the heck? Is that? <laughs> this is one of the reasons this is so challenging for us, right? But can, please continue. Uh, so, so five covered services, uh, substance abuse counseling, individual and group therapy, and toxicology testing. After comments, um, CMS also added intake activities, certain intake activities and periodic assessment services. Uh, we think this is a good change for uh, both providers and beneficiaries uh, as these services are important to developing a, a comprehensive and strategic treatment plan. So those are the, the services covered. To participate, um, to enroll as a, an OTP, uh, you've got to meet certain requirements, which Chelsea will cover in more detail later. So payments to OTPs are going to be bundled. Uh, the methodology is covered in 42 CFR 410.67B, and the bundle covers OUD treatment services during a, quote, episode of care. So an episode of care is a one-week or contiguous seven-day period. Um, CMS considered adding the concept of a partial episode of care in the proposed rule. Commenters pushed back on this um, on the grounds that there would, it would be burdensome to determine when the threshold was crossed between a partial episode of care and a, and a full episode of care. For instance, um, you know, is it based on the number of days services are provided or the number of different services provided during the week-long period? Uh, so after considering public comment, um, CMS scrapped that concept. Uh, they noted that their primary objective is to is to to treat the or combat the opioid crisis and to provide these services to beneficiaries. <clears throat> um, but CMS did caution that it will be monitoring for abuse, and that the partial episode of care concept will probably be revisited in the future and uh, possibly implemented. Uh, but for now, if any service is provided during the episode, uh, the full bundle payments made. Okay, another trivia question. So the OUD, maybe it's weird in how my mind works, but it makes me think of R-O-U-S. -O so if you know what an R-O-U-S is, um, you're a fan of a movie. Uh, it happens to be Bob Bovier's favorite movie. So if you're an employment lawyer fan, you would maybe know that. First person to get that one right, We'll get a prize. All right. So, site of service. Um, substance abuse counseling and individual and group therapy may be furnished via two way interactive audio, audio video communication technology as clinically appropriate and in compliance with all applicable requirements. Now, here CMS cautioned that OTP should be mindful of all data security requirements and state rules, and that CMS is not in any way expanding the scope of practice of a healthcare professional or authorizing practice in a particular jurisdiction. So next slide, uh, payment for telehealth services. So again, consistent with the opioid crisis theme, three new HCPCSG codes were added as uh, Medicare telehealth services. Codes are listed on the slide. Um, there were no public requests to add services to the telehealth services list. Uh, the deadline annually for doing so is February 10th. Um, with that, I will hand off the presentation to Chelsea to discuss some issues related to Medicare enrollment. Great. So, as Andrew mentioned, CMS finalized the enrollment requirements for the OTPs. Um, of note, because OTPs are a provider type that's distinct from clinic and group practices with different requirements and different conditions for enrollment, a currently enrolled clinic or group practice will need to separately enroll as an OTP if it wishes to bill for OTP services. Separately certified and accredited OTPs must be separately enrolled, and multiple OTPs cannot be grouped under a single enrollment. So you can start submitting these applications immediately and CMS is encouraging you to uh, do so if you want to begin billing on and after the benefit commencement date of January 1st, 2020. As the slide mentions, um, there's a few things that are going to be required for enrollment, including valid accreditation by an accrediting body, um, as well as valid certification. You have to pay the fee. 
Uh, note that CMS is updating the CMS 855 form to include the new category for OTP, um, and you're going to need a provider enroll agreement as well. Um, something else I thought was interesting is that the OTPs are going to be subject to heightened scrutiny. So newly enrolling OTPs that have been fully and continuously certified by SAMHSA since October 23rd of 2018 will be assigned to the moderate risk level of categorical screening. And those that have not been continue, fully and continuously certified are going to be in the high risk level of categorical screening. So tucked into this is also a new enrollment revocation reason. And this is not limited to OTP, but is uh, tucked into these rules. So the, full, uh, so the text is up on the screen there. And what I thought was very interesting is that this is going to permit CMS to revoke or deny um, enrollment if a physician or another provider has been subject to prior action from a state oversight board, federal or state health care program, um, and an independent review organization, uh, et cetera, if the underlying facts reflect improper professional conduct that led to patient harm. So CMS is going to be considering another number of factors uh, in, to make that determination. Uh, but if you think this sounds vague and like a subjective set of criteria, then you're probably not alone. Uh, this change received a lot of comments, and CMS is adamant that this will be fairly applied because the inquiry will be focused on patient harm. CMS did scale this back a little bit to ensure that they weren't dissuading providers from self-reporting and receiving treatment for substance abuse, but it'll be interesting to see how this revocation reason is applied in practice. Okay, so another theme we saw uh, in this year's final rule is the concept of reducing administrative uh, burdens. So one area where CMS is trying to do this is with respect to the review and verification of medical record documentation. So in 2018, CMS updated its claims processing manual to expressly provide teaching physicians could review and verify or sign and date notes made by a student in a patient's medical record for E&M services rather than having to redocument the information, largely duplicating the student's notes. CMS wanted to expand that privilege to physicians, PAs, NPs, CNSs, and CNMs who furnish and bill for their professional services. After the comment period, CMS also added CRNAs to that list. Uh, you can see uh, the CFR sections where the, the edits are being made up on the slide. Um, this concept would apply to all services paid under the physician fee schedule. And CMS uh, is hopeful this change will help reduce note bloat and clinician burnout. <clears throat> um, of note, I think some commenters suggested that CMS should allow practitioners to sign off on, only on notes made by students in the same discipline. So in other words, say a PA would only be able to uh, review and verify sign and date notes made by a PA student. Uh, CMS rejected this comment, um, I, I, I think, correctly to uh, ease the burden on all the different uh, practitioner types. So before you move on, this is one, this one bothers me a lot because, well, I, okay, I have to be clear. I'm glad CMS is doing this, but it's unnecessary because who writes something in the medical record doesn't matter. And we've mentioned this in webinars before, but you know, if, if, some, if a physician had to personally document in the medical record, dictation wouldn't exist, right? Dictation can exist because anyone can write in the medical record. There was never a requirement that the doctor had to redocument things. Lord knows where that myth came from. It's out there. I'm glad that they are trying to put a stake through the heart of that myth, but it's a myth. And, and I think in the comments, um, uh, CMS did get into uh, our scribes, part of the medical team, can scribes make entries in the record, and they were receptive to that. So uh, to your point, David, I, I think they do get that. Um, so next slide. All right. So in response to feedback that CMS received, it's going to begin to transition the MIP to the MVP maybe, uh, I don't know, MIV. Uh, so the, it's going to, it stands for the MIPS Value Pathways Framework. Um, and this is going to be starting up in 2021. So CMS's goals with this transformation are associated with more streamlined and cohesive reporting, enhanced and timely feedback, and the creation of MV, the MVPs of integrated measures and activities that are meaningful to all clinicians, from specialists to primary care clinicians and to patients. 
So the physicians and the MVPs are going to focus their MIPS participation on a set of measures tailored to an episode of care or condition starting in the 2021 performance period. The MVP framework would also provide enhanced data and feedback to physicians. CMS has not finalized the MVPs, but they may include administrative claims population, health, uh, care coordination, um, specialty condition-specific measures. Um, so on the Medicare Shared Savings Program quality measures, CMS finalized a set of 23 measures on which ACO's quality performance will be assessed for the performance year of 2020 and subsequent performance years. Uh, in this final rule, CMS stated that the majority of the comments it received were opposed to aligning the Shared Savings Program quality score with the MIPS uh, quality performance category score. CMS stated that it, uh, as it plans for future updates and changes to the Shared Savings Program quality scoring methodolo methodology, it will consider this feedback that it received in the development of its proposals. Moral of the story is more to come. All right, opposite of our theme of reducing administrative burdens, we're going to increase administrative burdens for ground ambulance service providers. Um, there is a new data collection system um, where CMS is going to be sampling 25% uh, of all ground ambulance organizations for each of the four years of data collection. So the ambulance organizations are going to be required to use a data collection tool that CMS has developed, and it's going to have to provide 12 months of continuous data. The data tool will collect information on service areas, response time, number of responses, level of services provided, cost of vehicles, cost of facilities, et cetera. The goal of the data is to evaluate the extent to which reported costs relate to payment rates under the ambulance fee schedule, evaluate the utilization of capital equipment and ambulance capacity, and evaluate different types of ground ambulance services furnished in different geographic locations, including rural areas and low population density areas. Uh, one thing that we wanted to flag is that if you're selected to participate, you do need to collect and report the information, or you're going to face a penalty of 10% of a 10% reduction in your Medicare payment. Services are not going to be exempt for reasons like financial hardship unless you're facing bankruptcy. So, you know, when you talk about ground ambulance, I cannot help but think about an ambulance that's been put through like a meat grinder. But continue. That's all I'm picturing is like a little ambulance patty. Ambulance patty. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I was, yes, I was picturing a lot of shredded metal. So that, that sounds a little bit better. Um, just a quick note that commenters were generally supportive of the goal to ensure the payments for ambulances reflected costs, but uh, again, are concerned about this 10% penalty and the long term effect that this is going to have on providers. Uh, so, getting into our last theme here, um, deferring to state scope of practice requirements is something. Uh, that the fee schedule is focused on this year. Just a quick note that now under uh, the new rules, nurse anesthetists may perform the pre-surgical anesthesia risk evaluation in the AFC setting. Um, and for hospices, um, in 2019, CMS revised the requirement for an attending physician so that a physician assistant may serve in that role. However, hospices could not accept orders for drugs from attending physicians who are PAs. Um, so now they have updated that to allow PAs to um, serve in that role. So another change with respect to PAs is uh, physician supervision of uh, PA services. So a little background on this issue. CMS published an RFI in the 2018 rule on uh, seeking comments on flexibility, areas for flexibility and efficiency. So it's a request for, for information. Request for information, yes, yes, sorry. Um, so in response, PAs pushed for looser restrictions. A CMS had previously interpreted the supervision requirement statutory uh, with respect to PAs to require general supervision, which uh, of the three levels is the, the most lenient, more lenient than personal or direct. Um, and since PA services became covered in the 80s, uh, PAs have become more autonomous. I think CMS gets that uh, uh, across uh, many different states, and their scope of practice has also been expanded. So CMS updated the regulations um, on the next slide here. It's uh, the, the language of the regulation is excerpted there. And you can see some of the language is, is in red and bolded. And it's, it's just to emphasize that CMS is really deferring to the states on this issue where the state's laws or rules explicitly address the physician supervision requirement. If it is explicitly addressed, 
then uh, that level of supervision uh, is sufficient for Medicare purposes. If it's not explicitly addressed in the state's laws, the PA must have a working relationship with the physician to supervise delivery of services. Uh, some commenters pushed, pushed for a more specific supervision requirement, such as uh, participating in a physician health care, or I'm sorry, a physician-led team, but CMS uh, declined to go down that road. Um, <clears throat> finally, the, the rule requires documentation only at the practice level. CMS was originally considering documentation in every patient's medical record, but uh, landed on the practice level for that, which I think is good. So some kind of miscellaneous FYIs um, as we close out the physician fee schedule. Coinsurance for colorectal cancer screening tests. The issue here is that these tests can convert from a fully covered benefit to a uh, diagnostic test uh, if lesions or polyps are discovered, which um, comes with a coinsurance payment. Uh, beneficiaries, obviously, uh, that's uh, upsetting when they think a, a service is going to be covered and it's not uh, fully covered. Um, and CMS considered requiring prior notification to beneficiaries of this potential charge, ultimately declined to impose that requirement after comments. Um, CMS has also solicited uh, in the proposed rule comments on opportunities for bundled payments. The Innovation Center is testing models um, to increase efficiency, per, uh, perhaps on a per beneficiary population basis or bundles based on episodes of care. Um, wouldn't be surprised to see uh, changes coming based on those comments in the future. Finally, uh, the last FYI I'm going to cover on this slide is uh, non-emergency ambulance services. There had been some confusion about whether there was CMS-required form of the physician certification statement. CMS clarified there is no such required form. Really quick, uh, one more FYI from me. There is an expansion of the Open Payments Program. Just a quick reminder that the goal of the Open Payments Program is to promote transparency by providing information to the public about the financial relationships between the pharmaceutical and medical device industry and certain types of healthcare providers. So under Section 1128G of the Social Security Act, manufacturers of covered drugs, devices, biologicals, or medical supplies, as well as group purchasing organizations, must annually submit uh, information about certain payments or other transfers of value made to, quote, covered recipients. This has historically been limited to physicians and teaching hospitals, but this year covered recipient was expanded to include PAs, NPs, CNSs, CRNAs, and CNMs. Um, payments or other transfers of value that must be reported include things like research, honoraria, gifts, travel expenses, meals, grants, and other compensation. This year, we added more categories to include debt forgiveness, long-term medical supply or device loans, and acquisitions. Um, the last change that was made this year is a little technical one, and I'm not even going to cover it. Okay, before we get into the E&M stuff, I just want to announce our winners. Uh, and first, an important note, like most, you, you assume everything you do on the internet, people know who you are. That is less true here. So the way you sign in matters. So the winner of the first question, which is when the IDTF rule came out, which was Halloween 1997, Vicky knew the answer. I don't, I, I'm, I'm betting I can figure out who Vicky is, but I don't know Vicky's last name. Uh, because the way our system works is whatever you sign in with, we know. And so like if you ask us a question or send a comment, you might want to put your name in to make sure we have it. Um, the, R o the R O U S is rodents of unusual size. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Princess Bride. Pro tip: Don't show it to your kids too early because they will then hate the movie and tell you when they're teenagers that they are mad at you for having shown it to them too early because it is in fact a great movie. But when they were nine, they were terrified. I had a uh, similar experience with birds um, as about an eight or nine year old. The Alfred Hitchcock movie it is not right for a nine year old. No, no. Uh, I, I, I can confirm that. that. That makes sense. So, but birds, as we know from others, our birds are bad. Um, and I do feed the birds, but that's our whole, that's a government investigation slide. Uh, all right. So, pretty big changes to ENM. And one of the things I said that this is often a hard topic, part of it is it's often humbling for us. So, I was humbled by this one because it took me several readings to realize that they're making dramatic changes to the E&M system, effective 1121, but I didn't notice for several reads that this only affects office visits. 
it doesn't affect hospital visits. So here's what they're doing. So back up a year. What they did last year is they said, hey, we're going to make the same payments for levels two through four. So 99212 to 99214 or 202 to 214. And those are established patient and new patient office visits. There are five levels of service for them. So what they said is that we're going to take the levels two through four and make one payment rate and then have another payment rate for level five. That was the plan last year. That ain't what happened. Uh, what they've done instead is said, we're going to keep the codes, we're going to keep them separately, but we're going to totally change effective 1121. So this is not effective this January, but a year out. We're going to change uh, how you choose the level of code. Doctors can choose either to do it based on time or medical decision making. You may know right now you, you, it's either history exam and medical decision making or time. We're going to get rid of, uh, uh, we're, we're getting rid of all of the history and exam as a relevant factor for office based EM coding. Now, this is supposedly reducing paperwork and it's great. But it did not dawn on me, they're not doing it for hospitals. And so, like, I was thinking, oh, now doctors don't have to worry about all this history and physical stuff. And they still do in the hospital, which is really weird. Um, but the whole, like, 1995, 1997 guideline stuff, that's gone. You can't choose that for office visits. Um, I guess so those of you who have read, I like to read about uh, social science theory. There's the paradox of choice. It's the idea that you know, if there are too many kinds of peanut butter, it stresses you out and you, rather than being happy to have this extra choice, are stressed by it. Well, they don't believe how paradox should have choice. Now, this is maybe a good time to mention, we've already received a complaint on this webinar that was, I believe, quote, where are the far side cartoons? Uh, and you know who you were, person who raised this complaint and friend of mine. Uh, and it was a fair complaint, and I apologize. I did not put any in. None of us put any in. So we just have stupid puns like this. Uh, oh, and I did not. Announce, I don't always announce the winners uh, of stuff, but I will mention the rodents of unusual size. Catherine, if you're, you know, I'm not going to go with the last names. I don't like to out people who are listening, which is part of why I don't uh, do this. All right, more on E&M. Another big change. Historically, time only included time face to face with the patient. And if you go back years and years, there was this case, the Krizak case, where a psychologist um, was rung up on False Claims Act charges for billing more than 24 hours of time in a day. And actually, this is a really interesting case because what the court wound up doing in that one was saying, you don't, they only, uh, they assumed that he worked eight hours a day, whether there was good documentation to support it or not. And so that case, while it, it finds False Claims Act liability for a doctor is also a helpful case for demonstrating that if it isn't written, it wasn't done, is not the law. And boy, there were too many negatives there. You don't have to have documentation to avoid a False Claims Act liability. But the judge in that case said, wow, this is nuts. If you make a phone call standing next to the patient, that time counts. If you walk out into the hall and make the same phone call, the time doesn't count. That case, which I want to say is 1996, so here we are, quick math, this is 30 years later, I think. Uh, 30 years later, uh, not quite. Uh, uh, we are, uh, so it's uh, 20 years later, we are changing that to say time coordinating care will count even if it's not face-to-face. -face. Um, they're adding these prolonged service codes, and if you've got either 55 minutes, 70 or 85 for levels, uh, uh, three, four, and five, you'll be able to do various or various established uh, uh, new patient codes. You'll have be able to bill for, well, I just mangled that, but you'll be able to bill a prolonged service code. The time has to occur within the same calendar day. Um, and there were comments in there about split and shared visits being able to be done by different people. It was interesting and in how they, they, they said that there were interesting comments received about split and shared visits and who can do them. And what's fascinating about that to me is I wouldn't have thought you can combine time. Historically, we thought you can't combine time. It was weird in there. It's just a, a throwaway comment, and I don't know what it means. Another area where I'm possibly humbled, or at least stupid, uh, is I think they're changing the amount of time that goes with each level of service. I don't understand this chart, 
and I read through this section a few times, and I'm going to have to punt a little, but I believe that the, the column that says actual total time, the second one from the right, is I think what they're going to say, the amount of time you need going forward to bill a 99212 will be 16 minutes, which is different than right now it's 10, uh, and 213s, and actually there's a range right now, right, because you, you can round up. So a 213 is anticipated to be 15 minutes, but it's anything, but, you know, um, uh, between, uh, so, you know, a four is 25, and so you go back between 15 and 25, and if it's less than 20, you round down, more you round up. I think that these are the new times, but I have to punt here because I was puzzled by that. Okay, uh, and so just to emphasize, that all happens 1121, and it doesn't change hospital billing, just clinic. All right. So before we completely transition into the fraud and abuse portion of the webinar and leave the physician fee schedule behind, a uh, quick update on Stark. Just a reminder that Stark prohibits a physician from referring a Medicare beneficiary for certain designated health services to an entity with which the physician or a member of the physician's immediate family has a financial relationship unless an exception applies. So CMS annually updates the DHS code or designated health service uh, DHS code list for the following categories of DHS, clinical lab services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and outpatient speech language pathology services, radiology, and other certain imaging services and radiation. The DHS code list is exhaustive for these four categories. This list is available on CMS's website, and the additions and deletions are available on this slide here. The other cool thing that is in there that's good to know is the level of supervision for so there are these are good bookmarks. So if you want to know the level of supervision for a diagnostic test. That also appears in this rule, um, and we don't talk about changes that are there, but it's a good thing to know because it tells you, do you need general, which is just sort of an oversight level, direct, you have to be somewhere in the office suite, personal, somewhere in the room, um, and, and those are indicated by numbers with a, a one being personal, two being direct, three being general, and then nine being the, the diagnostic test rule doesn't apply. All right, we're next gonna talk about something that seems like it's a big topic, and I'm gonna spend very little time on it because I don't think it is a big topic. So there are proposed anti-kickback safe harbors. So why don't we think that this is a big thing? Well, one reason is they're only proposed, and some part of us says if it's proposed, wait until it, it's finalized. I couldn't list the number of times proposed rules never came home. But I think it's particularly unimportant to think about anti-kickback safe harbors because you don't need to be within a safe harbor, right? So here are the details. You can click on the link there if you want to find it. We've got the site. Uh, if you want to comment on it, you can do so through the end of the year. The basic idea that's going on is CMS hears that people are nervous and that they're not going to do value-based purchasing because of fears of the anti-kickback statute. So they want to tweak a bunch of the exceptions, personal services, warranties, the electronic health record one, and then create some specific value-based purchasing safe harbors. But remember, you don't need to meet a safe harbor. The anti-kickback statute is all about intent, and most deals you're doing for value-based purchasing, if your heart is pure, you don't have to worry about the kickback statute. And so whether or not there's a safe harbor is not going to cause us to, to cast aspersions on a deal. So I'm not that worried about them, and we're not gonna detail them in a meaningful way. There are also some proposed Stark changes. They came out the same day in the same Federal Register. Their comments are also due on before the end of the year. They're also only proposed, but I think these are more important, and they're more important for two reasons. One is the actual regulatory text matters more for Stark because Stark is hyper-technical. Anti-kickback is all about intent, and you don't have to meet a safe harbor. Stark doesn't give a rip about intent. If you have compensation between a doctor and an organization that provides a designated health service, you have to fit an exception. And so the wording of the exceptions really matters. But they're still only proposed, so I'm not super obsessed with it, except some of the comments clarify longstanding interpretations, and I think those are effective today. So what are they talking about changes? They're talking about changing some definitions. A lot of it is gonna focus on fair market value, and so they're gonna define the term commercially reasonable, and fair market value, potentially create a definition of something called general market value. 
They're going to create exceptions for value-based activity and define it. I'm not going to walk you through all of those details because this is where I go, we'll worry about that when it's real. Um, and some of these are clearly not completely thought out. My personal favorite was at some point they're creating a new definition of the term entity and they ask in the preamble, would it be confusing if we use the term entity in two different ways in the rule? And that's a question that shouldn't need to be asked, right? Um, yeah, it would. Now, they're going to make changes to the comp formula that I just note because historically we've told you if you want to credit physicians for uh, things that would be designated health services, but they're done for private pay patients, say imaging done for a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient, we've historically said knock yourself out not necessarily loving the idea because if you screw up, you'll violate Stark. If there's some Medicare patient that you accidentally credit for, that's a problem. And Lord knows where Medicare Advantage patients fall in there. So you're playing with fire, but it's legal if, if to, to credit people for non-Medicare and Medicaid patients. Well, they're proposing to get rid of that, but it's only proposed. But here's the thing that I think matters today. It's changing the, the definition of takes into account and explaining what they mean by takes into account. So compensation will take into account a, re a referral if the compensation includes the physician's referrals to the entity as a variable, resulting in an increase or decrease in the physician's or an immediate family member's, because remember Stark applies to members, compensation that positively correlates with the number or value of referrals. Now, I have to give a shout out here to a uh, I was going to say a colleague, but he's at a different law firm. So Jesse Witten helped clarify my thinking on this, because when I first read this, I thought CMS got it wrong. And so one of the important words in here is a variable, all right? Um, a variable is a mathematical term. If you think of algebra, it's X. So you need a direct variable. So what do I mean by that? Um, if, if, if you said compensation um, will, will go up generally with your more senior, but there's no mathematical formula, that's not a variable. But if you said, if you work here for five years, you get paid 120% of someone who's worked one year, that's a mathematical variable, all right? And a variable and correlation are kind of different. And so I looked at this and said, variables don't positively correlate. Um, but he helped me see, I think what they're saying, it has to be a variable that positively as opposed to negatively correlate. And so they're not saying all correlation is a problem. They're saying it has to be a variable, a mathematical in the formula variable, and it increases pay. I think that that's what this means. And I owe CMS an apology because the first time I read this, I thought that they were conflating the term variable and correlation. And I now think I am wrong, at least I hope I'm wrong, and that they understood it perfectly and that's what they were saying. And thank you, Jesse. Um, this is a big deal because there are cases, like the famous Toomey case, where courts have said, if your formula positively correlates with referrals, it takes into account referrals. And a positive correlation is obviously very different than mathematical. And I think this is, effect this is stating a CMS position um, it's not a regulatory change. You know, here's what they say. Um, you know, they're, they're clarifying that a productivity bonus doesn't take into account the volume or value of referrals just because, oh, this is actually slightly different, just because there's a corresponding hospital service that are billed each time. So we were involved in a Stark case, and the government in that one was hinting that if a doctor got a productivity bonus for services that occurred in the hospital, because there was a facility fee for each of those services, there was a positive correlation. And they were suggesting that that meant it took into account referrals and it's a problem. Well, this language, and you can read it on the screen, says, no, that's not the case, right? And so this is, this is a really big deal. And I don't think the fact that it's proposed is material. I think it's a big deal today. Pari, I think you're up next. Yeah, so we're going to spend some time on the outpatient prospective payment rule. Um, I thought that this year this one was full of interesting stuff, which is not something you can say about the outpatient prospective payment rule every year. So the link for it here came out in uh, just last month. There's a CFR, or sorry, the Federal Register site if you need it. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some highlights, an overall increase of 6.3 billion. We're going to talk about some changes to the inpatient-only list, some changes to supervision requirements for outpatient therapeutic services, a new prior authorization requirement, and then some updates on the site-neutral payment policy and 340. I'm going to sort of whiz through the inpatient-only list. So this is may be familiar to you, the inpatient only list is a list of procedures that CMS has identified as only appropriate in inpatient settings, so they are not reimbursable on the OPC app. Over time, as technology gets better, better and the sort of standard of care changes, some pr procedures have moved off of the IPO list. There's a five-factor test that's been established for that purpose. Um, this year, there are a handful of uh, procedures that have moved off the IPO list, total hip replacement and associated anesthesia codes, and then a handful of spine procedures. The list of the specific CP2 codes is at this page in the Federal Register if you are specifically interested in the nitty gritty. Um, there are a lot of comments about how a, in a lot of cases, particularly in the Medicare population, which tends to be more medically complex, that these particular procedures would actually not be appropriate on an outpatient basis and ought to be done inpatient. CMS sort of recognized that and indicated that inpatient admission may still be necessary for these procedures and that should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Importantly, remember that IPO procedures are exempt from the two midnight rules for inpatient admission. So if these procedures have been moved off of that list, you would now have to satisfy the two midnight rule or the, or the exception that you documented that inpatient status, inpatient level of care is necessary. Um, recognizing that there's going to be a transition to adjust here, um, CMS is going to ex accept or exempt uh, these procedures that have been recently removed from the list from claim of, site of service claim denials, eligibility for what I always think of as the BFF quick but it's not recalled <laughs> referrals to RAC for compliance um, with the two midnight rule and RAC reviews for patient status. And this is an exemption that'll last two years. That's not actually a, a best friend forever. That is better than a quick. first sight cartoon. <laughs> um, it is, and I have not seen that acronym before. Actually. It's a benefit in family centered care QIC. Wow. And it uh, has been monitoring compliance with the two midnight rule and providing sort of coaching where uh, providers have been non-compliant. One of the lessons, there are more acronyms than any of us can keep up with. But. I think that's definitely true. We just think of this one as your BFF. Maybe, or maybe not. No one likes to hear from a quick effort. <laughs> uh, so next topic, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the supervision requirement for outpatient therapeutic services. Uh, prior to this year's rule, uh, section 410.27 required direct supervision <clears throat> for most hospital outpatient therapy services. This rule amends the regulation to require a minimum level of general supervision, which, as David mentioned earlier, is easier to meet. And I just want to chime this stuff and this topic has driven us nuts for years. And there are differences between therapeutic services and diagnostic services, yes. and that's confusing. Um, there's differences between how they define direct supervision in the hospital and direct supervision in the clinic. So uh, this, is, this is a headache inspirer so far. It also changes with some frequency because this overhaul is actually comes in, in Medicare years fairly on the heels of the overhaul in 2010. Um, so this next slide is direct supervision requirement for this purpose, which is a little different than direct supervision for diagnostic tests that David was mentioning earlier. Um, direct supervision in this context meant, until the rule changed, um, that the physician or non-physician practitioner is immediately available to furnish assistance and direction throughout the performance of the procedure. doesn't require physical presence in the room, but, I mean, I think probably needs to be immediately available to render. Probably the 30-second test, which is how we operationalize the other yes. clinic-based direct supervision, but there's no reference to the office suite here. Absolutely. So instead, uh, they've amended the rule to cross-reference to this existing definition of general supervision, which means that the procedure is furnished under the physician's overall direction and control, but the presence is not, but the physician's presence is not required. Um, 
And the rationale for this is sort of interesting. Um, since 2010, CMS did not actually enforce direct supervision requirements for small rural hospitals or critical access hospitals because staffing is hard to get in those areas. Um, CMS referred to this as a two-tiered system of physician supervision. And the rationale for the change is basically this doesn't seem to be hurting um, small rural hospitals or critical access hospitals over a fairly long period of time, 10 years. And so that maybe this is an appropriate level of um, supervision for all hospitals. It's a true regulatory lesson, loosening. And I think that is one thing yeah. thematically we think this was a good year for actually making things better. Yes, on some stuff. Yeah. You'll love it when I get to prior authorization. <laughs> <laughs> um, so small caveats here. One is that the state scope of practice and supervision requirements will still apply. So state scope of practice says you have to have more supervision or supervision as provided in a delegation or even something. Then you have to obviously comply with that. Um, and the conditions of participation still make the medical staff responsible for the quality of services. So if the medical staff believes that you need to have more supervision, then you should arrange for more supervision. But you might want to check your medical staff roles and see if they put a higher burden on you than the law does. Great practical tip, David. Really good point. Um, and then pulmonary rehab, cardiac rehab, and intensive cardiac rehab still require direct supervision by a physician. This is a requirement that's existed since 2010, and it's actually different than the, the direct supervision requirement that was removed because this is a physician only, not a non-physician practitioner just in case you're getting snarled up on the details here. Thought I would contribute. Um, all right, we're gonna talk about this new prior authorization requirement. Um, CMS has noted a quote, significant increase in the utilization of some outpatient department services um, and is targeting services that are likely to be cosmetic and therefore not covered by Medicare as part of the prior authorization process, which is new. Uh, this is blepharoplasty, Botox, paniculectomy, uh, which I had to look up the pronunciation of on YouTube. That's when you make a panini in the hospital, right? Uh, yes. You have to remove the panini. Oh, you're removing the panini. <laughs> Um, rhinoplasty and vein ablation. So no, you can't tell what is I, what is a panini? It's a tummy tuck. Oh, it's a tummy tuck. And there are some. You've eaten um, too many paninis. Yes. Yeah. Yes, too many paninis need to remove them. Uh, in some cases, it can be medically necessary, but in in a lot of cases, it's cosmetic. That's the sort of uh, theme here. Uh, and what CMS did, which is sort of interesting, is they looked at the utilization rates over 11 years and determined that some of these procedures, notably not blepharoplasty increased at a rate that was faster than the average rate. Um, and therefore, they think that's unnecessarily utiliz unnecessary utilization. There was a series of comments about Botox in particular, which has sort of expanded in use for all sort of medical, you know, medically necessary um, uh, uses, including that it was approved by the FDA for treatment of migraines during this period of time. CMS says that it's an analysis adjusted for that. And um, uh, adjusted for that and, and that there's still some level of unnecessary utilization. So to create this prior authorization requirement, the statutory authority that they're claiming is a statute that allows CMS to create, quote, method, methods for controlling unnecessary increases in the volume of covered services. Remember that phrase, we'll come back to it. There's no parallel process for the ASC perspective payment system because there's not a parallel statutory provision for controlling unnecessary increases. Um, new regulation addressing this is at section 4.419.82 and 0.83. This process will be managed by the MAC. Uh, prior auth will be a condition of payment. So if you don't do it, you will not get paid. Um, it, the request for prior authorization has to include all of the documentation necessary to show compliance with coverage, coding, and payment rules. The MAC is to issue a provisional decision on the request within 10 business days, which commenters know could be as many as 15 days, depending on how we get the holidays fall, and the claim might still be denied. So it's not, it's, you are not guaranteed to be paid even if you get prior Um CMS recognizes that this is uh, potentially burdensome process, 
and has created a regulation as a shortcut for providers that are proven have proven compliance track records. Um, CMS may exempt a provider from the prior authorization. Oh, prior author, you guys, prior authorization. That's my fault. Process upon the provider's demonstration of compliance with the coding coverage and payment rules. Um, the demonstration must occur through the prior auth process, which means no one is exempt from the start. You all have to do it at the start. Uh, for reasons that we will talk about very shortly, uh, I think that was likely to get challenged in litigation. Uh, the site neutral payment policy, we're just marching through this. Uh, this is about uh, off can or excuse me, uh, off campus provider based departments. Generally speaking, they get paid on the OPPS. I'm really rushing through now. Uh, those payment levels have gone down over time to equalize to the physician fee schedule reimbursement rate. Um, the American Hospital Association challenged the statutory authority. Um, the Hospital Association argues this rule is not is impermissible because it is not budget neutral, which is a requirement of the Social Security Act. CMS claims it can make non-neutral changes under this should be familiar. Its authority to control unnecessary increases in volume, the same as the prior auth rule. Uh, the court disagrees with CMS and uh, vacated the 2019 rule and remanded to the rule to the agency for further action consistent with the correct legal standard. Um, the CMS's response in this rule is that they acknowledge that the 2019 rule has been vacated and states that the agency is working to ensure that affected 2019 claims are paid consistent with the court's order. Um, they are moving forward with the cut in 2020, asserting that they still have appeal rights. And, not sure that this solution is consistent with the court's order. Um, here's a quote. It says basically we disagree with the district court and we're going to move forward. Sticking with our bird theme, they're flipping the bird to the court. Ah, uh, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got sort of a similar story on the 340B drug reimbursement cuts. It's the drug discount program for certain covered entities, including. Some hospitals that serve underserved uh, populations. In the past, 340B drugs were purchased at a discount and then reimbursed at the average sale price of 6%. Um, you must reduce that reimbursement to average sale price minus 22.5%. You will notice that it's a nearly 30% swing. Uh, the American Hospital Association also sued about this, arguing that CMS violated the statute defining how 340B prices have to be set. It says that the reimbursement rates either must be average sale price plus six percent, or they can set another. The agency can set another rate based on the hospital acquisition data. CMS does not have hospital acquisition data, um, and did not use it in setting this new price. Uh, CMS argues that it has statutory authority to quote calculate and adjust rates, um, and that that uh, calculate and adjust authority justifies a thirty percent cut. Uh, the court sided with the American Hospital Association. Uh, the court remanded the rule and did not vacate it because that would be highly disruptive. That is probably right because this is a budget neutral issue, which means if the money comes out of 340B, it goes somewhere else. And so correcting that for a past year is arguably really difficult. Um, there's some sort of authority for the proposition that you don't have to be budget neutral on a remedy, but that's sort of in the weeds. Um, this case is now on appeal. It was argued a few weeks ago on November 8th. Uh, we'll see how it shakes out, but for the moment, CMS is moving forward with the cut. <laughs> um, and they have beginning, they've announced that they will begin the process to collect hospital acquisition cost data, which could be used to fashion a remedy because then they could set prices in a way that is actually compliant with that too. Okay, so we are close to the end of the hour. I'm gonna, we'll run over a bit. The figure, if you have to go, you can always listen to it on uh, on tape. But I think it's important, and we to talk about the price transparency rule, and then we'll do IPPS. Although that's so that's the price. Of the <laughs> on the road. <laughs> um, uh, so the price transparency rule, on the one hand, could maybe be a whole one hour webinar, and on the other hand, maybe it's we have to wait and see. So we're going to go somewhere between. Them. So you want to find it? Here's the link. It came out on uh, November 15th. It's effective one year from now, January 1st of 2021. Now, if you're a clinic, you can basically, uh, 
hang up now. We have a bunch of questions. We're going to answer the questions at the end. But if you're a clinic, you don't have to worry about this. It only applies to hospitals. It applies to all hospitals, including in some American territories that I have literally never heard of before. I can't even remember them right now. So, so what does it do? So it defines a bunch of terms. It's your de-identified maximum negotiated charge, which is the highest charge that you negotiate with all third-party payers, and then the minimum charge, the lowest one you do. A discounted cash price, which is the charge that applies to an individual who pays cash or cash equivalent. This is an interesting one because it's acknowledging that people do this. And those of you who have heard our pricing webinar know it's not crystal clear how that works, but everyone does it. And this is sort of acknowledging that everyone does it. And they're even defining a term for it. Um, they're setting up a gross charge, which is what's on your charge master. And then a machine readable format. Okay. And there's, so what they're saying is you're going to have to publish a bunch of these terms. Um, and so I'll explain it more in a second, but you're going to have to have a machine readable format, which is an XML, which I believe is an Excel spreadsheet, a JSON. I don't know what those are. Uh, and a CSV, I don't know, cardiac service. I have no idea what the <laughs> comma separated value. Ah, see, it's good to have, Robert, this is where producers come in handy. A comma separated value format. All right. And then a shoppable service. It's just kind of what you might think of. It's something you might think of ahead of time. So OB, you're planning to have a baby as opposed to an MI, you don't plan to have a heart attack. So you, it's services that you can shop ahead of time. So what this rule is basically doing is a couple of things. It's saying, it's setting up two requirements for publication. One is a list. Well, I guess we'll come to them in a minute. A list of all of your standard charges, which they define as your gross charge, and then your payer-specific negotiated charge. And if I'm reading this right, what I think this means is you have to list that your, your charge for purposes of this rule is every negotiated rate you have with every insurer. So if you have a, a service, you would have to list what every insurer has contractually agreed to pay you for that service. That is how I am reading this rule. It's a spreadsheet that is overwhelming in its size and scope. Okay, and so you'd have to list all of those. And then for some reason, you also have to list your de-identified maximum negotiated charge. And I don't know why you'd de-identify it because you've already listed your payer specific negotiated charge for every payer. So why are we de-identifying the maximum and the minimum? I have no idea. Um, and then you have to list your discounted, your discounted, that's, that was your disproportionate share payment cash price. Uh, and that was a joke off of dish, uh, never mind, the dish joke. All right. <laughs> So the hospital has to have a machine-readable file that has all of your standard charges, but this is confusing. If you go back, standard charge, remember, are all of those things. So your negotiated rate is a standard charge, not what's on the charge master. And um, so that's one thing you have to do is have a list of all of them. The second thing you have to do is create a list that is shoppable services. Okay, so two requirements. Now. Um, you're gonna ha you can get out of the shoppable service by having a, a a tool that patients can put stuff in for at least 300 different shoppable services. There's a list of 70 that CMS has, and then you have to have 230 more, and you can do it that way. So um, remember, this is what's got to be in your list, right? So it's it's a big old list. So now what's happening? Hospitals have filed a lawsuit to enjoin CMS from imposing this. They did it on December 4th. And they basically had three arguments. They say, hey, you don't have the statutory authority to do this. You can't compel speech. Um, and it's arbitrary and capricious. So I'm going to deal with the last two first. So the First Amendment does give you the right to speech, but the government can compel speech if it's advancing a material state interest. And I can't predict what courts are going to do all the time, but I don't think this First Amendment argument is going to go anywhere because I think a court will say, yeah, there's a state interest in having people know what people pay for, for their health care. I just think that's a non-start. Arbitrary and capricious, uh, you know, I've described some of the arbitrariness of parts of this, but I don't know if that's going to pass the day. But let's look at the statutory authority thing. And this is where things get interesting. So here's the statute. 
Now, the original version of the statute doesn't have anything in red and underlined, but I think it's the most important part of this statute because it requires all hospitals to publish a list of their standard charges for items and services provided by the hospital. Now, the hospital association is saying charges means your charge master because when we negotiate with a third party, that's a they they called it even a bespoke rate. It's it's not standard. It's specifically negotiated with that third party, and so it's not our standard charge. And I get that argument, but a this says standard charges, and that plural is interesting because now you could say it's charges because it's also referring to items, but you could say your standard charge for each item and service, and they didn't. They used charges plural, which suggests that whoever wrote this law knows that a hospital might have more than one charge. And I think that that's a pretty good argument based on the following principle. So I, I, like I, I, I talked about this on Monitor Monday this week, and one of the listeners sent me an email and was very worried because she was challenging my thinking. First, I love it when people challenge my thinking because it causes me to reconsider stuff. And she said, well, wait a minute, our charge is our charge master, and we have these different rates. Um, you know, if we send someone a bill for 100 bucks, whether they pay us, you know, even if they're going to pay us the contract rate, the bill still said $100. And I get that, but think of it in terms of a, a house. If I list my house on the uh, MLS for $300,000 and I sell it for $250,000 and you ask me, what did I sell the house for? I don't think I get to say $300,000 that was my list price. The price is the price you and I agreed on in the traction. Oh, so this is a charge. This doesn't say what's the price. It's the standard charge. And, and you could say, what did I charge for the house? And I could, you could say it was the listing price was the charge. But when you know you're going to take a smaller payment as payment in full, I think a court might say that that's your charge. That if, if you know you're not going to put the person into collection, that's your charge. Now, I don't know that that's how it's going to come out. But I think that there's a very, very real risk. So in any event, that lawsuit is underway. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get some results that, you know, they could do anything from say the whole thing is invalid. They could say parts of it are invalid um, or they could all, let it all pass. And I'm not the best court predictor, but uh, all right, Pari is gonna do the IPPS and then we've got our boatload of questions that we will try to slog through. Uh, I'm gonna do this so quickly because there perhaps has never been a less eventful 1200 pages in the federal register. Here's a link if you are looking to really dig in. Um, highlights is an overall, and this is the only IPPS slide, guys. Uh, this is an overall increase of 3.8 billion. There's some modifications to the wage index that are intended to reduce disparities for low wage, often rural hospitals. These are specific to the bottom 25% uh, uh, wage hospitals. Um, there's some increases to payments under the new technology add-on program and a, a different pathway for, for new devices to qualify for that program. And there's a sort of small tweak to a number of the quality and reporting programs, some of which are tied to reimbursement. Um, I'm happy to get into the nitty gritty of any of those, but I would for sure I think to move your question. All right, we got a boatload of them and we'll try to move through them expeditiously. So can you please clarify on the supervision changes? Is it just therapy or is it therapeutic services? And it's therapeutic services, okay? Um, this, when you say office-based in regards to the e &M changes, does that include outpatient hospital services with the place of service outpatient hospital? Um, that is hospital-based practices. That's an excellent question. Um, I believe that the answer is yes, that it, because it's the codes, it's the office visit codes. And so I am pretty sure it applies. I am less sure than I would like to be to say yes, but I think it's a coding question and not a place. And so I think what I really should have said was codes uh, 99212. I know who you are, a person who asked this question, and I will check and get back to you, but I think that that is correct. Um, what did David say about time in split and shared visits? So I, I thought that there was a hint in here that maybe you can use, that they're going to let you have split and shared visits where time with different professionals will count towards the visit. 
Um, I kind of read that as suggested in the preamble. I'm not taking that to the bank. It is not something I would think is true today. Um, hang on, I'm just going to move us to the next slide up here because there's this cool nerdy thing where while you're listening to the questions, if you want to add any of us in on LinkedIn, you can scan us and you can also see how nerdy I look and how regular my colleagues are. Uh, okay, but back to the split shared things. It was just a hint of something that was in there that suggested we might, that there might be a room for a new opportunity. I wouldn't take it to the bank. And right now, I would say for time, if a physician and a nurse practitioner both see the patient and you're billing off of time, you cannot combine their time and bill it under the doctor. And there was sort of a hint that maybe they're going to let that happen. Um, is there any information on whether commercial payers are going to follow the new ENM guidelines as well? Nothing in here. I mean, this is a Medicare physician fee schedule, so we don't have the faintest idea what the commercial payers will do. No one does. Um, I, one would hope that they will follow suits. They generally do over time, but who knows? I think this is a Chelsea question. Um, does the enrollment revocation regulation apply to both providers and suppliers? And, so, and maybe you can explain the, the difference between a provider and a supplier. So the new regulation is going to apply to physicians or other eligible providers. Um, then it's going to give you a citation to eight, Section 1848 K3B of the Social Security Act. Um, and that's going to that lists other eligible providers as physical or occupational therapists or a qualified speech language pathologist, uh, qualified audiologist, PA, PA, CRNAs, and the list goes on. And so if you hear it aloud thunk now, that was me beating my head against the wall because this is CMS using the word provider the wrong way. And I feel a little nerdy when I say provide, we're not going to use the term provider for people. You could call them professionals. Um, Non-physician practitioners, I think professionals sounds more respectful. Providers in Medicare are places. They are hospitals. They are skilled nurses. They have facility fee. It's a defined term in the statute. And shame on you, CMS person who wrote this, for using the term provider here because they're suppliers. And that's the term you set up. And it, so use your own term. Okay. That was... I got a little worked up there. Uh, all right, so slide nine, I think this is for Andrew. This doesn't just apply to students, right? Um, audiology does the testing workup. The doc pulls the note into their note and adds names. Is that okay? So the, the changes to the regs don't just apply to students. Um, the types of students that are covered are specifically enumerated. But with respect to other individuals um, who, who can enter into the medical record, it includes physicians, residents, nurses, and other members of the medical team. Um, and CMS did it purposefully in the comments they talk about, and this is at um, in the Federal Register, 84-682-684. They purposefully talk about how they did not want to get into defining who was included among the other members of the medical team noted that it could potentially include scribes, dietitians, nutritionists, or others, depending on the circumstances. But so let's go to the big picture, and we'll tie in a question from Laura here, who said, hey, could, you know, I talked about the myth that a doctor has to personally write stuff, and she said, could this myth be based on people's assumptions that it has to be indicated somewhere in the electronic record? In EPIC, if the MA or the uh, whoever's put it into the history section, we tell our, our professionals that they can simply state that we've reviewed and confirmed the history and the record. That's fine, and it, who writes it doesn't matter. And like the patient can write it, right? You can have the patient fill out a form describing their current illness. It's ideal for the doctor to note that he or she saw that, like that would be a preferred thing. I'm assuming the doctor did look at it because that's what doctors do. I would not, you know, there isn't an explicit requirement that says the doctor must say that they saw it in order to get credit. Is that a best practice? Absolutely a best practice, no doubt. Best practices and requirements aren't the same. And there's just nothing that says that, you know, you need to sign or prove you saw it. I recommend you do it so you don't have to hire us to fight about this. But anyone, you know, if, it's in, if, if the patient fills out a form describing what happened, I hope the doctors are looking at them. Otherwise, we're, why are we making patients fill this junk out? All right, um, let's see, has there been any parameters constitutes what other members of the medical team? And I think we've kind of covered that one. Is anyone holding a question that we did not 
do you, there are some there are a couple that we are either stumped by or something and we will we will approach you offline um, you're always welcome to send one of us a question when you fill out your evaluation for this and you please do remember if you want one of us to if you're saying please contact me we won't know who you are so like if you want to say tell glazer to stop making those dumb jokes you can say that in your evaluation and i will never know who you are unless you put your name in it um, but that means if you say have pari call me she won't be able to unless you put your name in it uh, next webinar in january is on interesting business models and Ryan and Steve, so Steve Beck and Ryan Johnson have some really creative ideas, so that'll be worth listening to. And then send, you know, Katie Ilton your emails on what opioid topics you want us to cover, because that will be February. Uh, thank you much for those who celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas for the a-religious, happy nothing for the, winter. you know, happy winter. Happy winter. Uh, you know, I put myself, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to be in the happy new year, and may you have 2020 vision.